Okay. Um, my name is Nicole O'Gale. I'm one of the psychologists with the division. And today we're going to be talking about autism spectrum disorder. Um, this is my area of interest. This is where I've done um, a lot of extra work in. Uh, so hopefully I can give you some valuable information about it. Um, I've worked with kids who have autism for about 10 years, one-on-one, um, -on -one, as well as doing assessments for autism. And so I just wanted to first start out really with, um, in the chat, if you wanted to put in kind of your connection with autism spectrum disorder or ASD. Um, I'm assuming a lot of you might work with children who have autism or maybe have a personal connection. Um, if you don't want to put your connection in the chat of how um, you know or work with someone with autism, that's okay as well if you don't feel that you need to. Um, but just it would be nice to know kind of where some people are maybe with their knowledge of autism or um, if you're working with a child um, in the school system all the time or just sometimes if there's anyone who wants to share. If not, we'll move on. Okay, I'm okay with no one sharing. Rising. Okay, so we would have some special people working in specialized schools. Okay, um, I'm hoping that this is for um, some of it for who have worked for people who have worked with autism for many years. Some of it might be review. Hopefully, there's a couple new things or some recent research that I can provide you with that might be a little bit helpful. Um, but um, for some who have worked with children with autism for a while, some of it might be um, just a review and maybe uh, brush up on some of the skills. Okay, so we have a couple people in younger with younger grades, older grades. Okay, perfect. So um, this is kind of what I hope to do today. Um, some knowledge about autism, the challenges that people with autism experience, and ultimately how we support um, those people with autism. Overall, um, we're looking at the population of people in the world who have autism. It's similar to other disorders in that the global rates are actually increasing over time. So about 1% right now of the population is said to have autism. Um, and this is similar to ADHD, other things that um, the increase can be due to our increased awareness of the symptoms and how we're accurately diagnosing it. Uh, we're missing uh, autism less and misdiagnosing less, um, but there's possibly other factors as well. So the origin of autism is actually quite poorly understood. Uh, we know that there is a genetic part and an environmental part, but the actual um, reason why we um, have increasing autism in the world is really unknown. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard a lot of these terms. Um, high functioning autism is one that I know is very popular still today, Asperger's um, or PDD in OS. And I'll explain the terms here as a shift from um, these terms to what we are now calling autism spectrum disorder. This is kind of our, uh, the difference. So this is old criteria. We called them pervasive developmental disorders previously. This is the DSM-5, so the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. That's the four. We're currently on the five. Um, and they really broke them down into separate categories when we're looking at autism or how we used to look at autism. So high-functioning autism, that term that we saw before, um, what they're really talking about were the people that were diagnosed with Asperger's. So we've changed that. Oh, Samantha, I think you're presenting. Sorry, I'll just resume my presentation. Um, when we're talking about um, high functioning autism, that is, we've really changed our view because why high functioning might seem like a compliment, um, it's not a diagnostic term and the shift occurred because what's really communicated through that is that there is a hierarchy. So some people being above other people, there's high functioning individuals, um, they might, their difficulties might not be perceived as severe or not as important um, as those who are more severely affected. And it's attempting to explain that um, the child may not be as affected by the symptoms of autism. Um, they might have decreased severity, or frequency, or duration of behavior. Um, their difficulties might be mild to the observer, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a significant struggle with some of the categories that we see for autism. So high functioning people can really have as many challenges 
um, as anyone else on the spectrum. And they might surprise people around them by exhibiting behaviors that are not really typical of a high functioning individual. And this can impact their self-esteem um, because they're really expected to deal with changes. Um, whereas people who might appear more affected um, people understand their symptoms more, um, it's more observable. So this chart is really an old way of looking at our diagnosis related to autism. The autistic disorder is kind of that classic, um, what people think of when they think of autism, there's more delays in cognition and language, and then the social impairments and the restricted repetitive stereotype behaviors, interests and activities along the bottom. Um, that is similar for Asperger's, but um, there's no cognitive or language delays there. So that is why they were considered more high functioning because there's relatively average IQ and no delays. So um, the other one that people might have heard of was PDD NOS, so that's pervasive developmental developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, which just generally meant um, you had some of the symptoms, some of the characteristics, but you didn't really meet criteria for either of those two that you see on the screen. So um, they just gave a different diagnosis that you have many autistic-like traits, but you didn't really fit neatly into any category. So um, we can kind of see the drawbacks of having those distinct categories, which is why it is now considered a spectrum. And I use this picture, um, this is actually from the art of autism .com. Um, It provides more depth for the diagnosis of autism. So even though many people refer to it like a rainbow, like a spectrum, um, rainbows still have a beginning and an end. But if you think of this type of color spectrum, it's really accurately depicts the depth and complexity of the diagnosis and the variation in ability. So you can see the different areas um, or different spectrum that you can have in a bunch of different areas related to autism um, because it's very common to have an uneven profile of skills with autism spectrum disorder. So it's just when you're thinking of a visual or using a visual to explain autism maybe to parents, um, this is a really good one to capture more of the differences in skills in different areas that can occur. Um, this is our diagnosis that we use now, um, really just um, two things that we're looking at when we're diagnosing autism now, um, social communication and social interaction difficulties. And there's a bunch of different areas in that. And then restrictive repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. Um, that is a long name. I'm going to refer to that as RRBs going on, um, just so you know what they are. It's that second bullet there. Um, and really, those are the two things that we're looking at for autism, as well as some of the specifiers. So two encompass the different diagnosis that existed before. Um, we really tried to add on specifiers. So you could have with or without an intellectual impairment or with or without a language impairment um, to more capture all of the diagnoses that used to be because everything is now in the, uh, the spectrum of autism. Very quickly, I'll go over some of the, just the two diagnostic categories and then we'll move on. This is the social communication category. So um, if you think of a student you've worked with who's had autism, you might want to think where they fall in this category. Um, we have non-spectrum individuals and then when you're diagnosed with autism, you're given a level of one, two, or three, which is really just how much support you require. Um, we see level one, you require support, um, you might have difficulty starting interactions, having reciprocal conversations or your interactions might just be a little bit odd or maybe sometimes unsuccessful. And then we go uh, jump up to level three and you require very substantial support for social communication. Um, you might really only respond to people if they directly approach you or you might not respond or you might have um, approaches just to meet your own needs or wants. So really more significant challenges with social communication there. And it's very similar for RRBs. Um, non-spectrum individuals and then level one, two, and three. So you have individuals in level one who are inflexible in their behavior. Um, maybe they have trouble organizing or shifting between activities and then they jump up to level three. There's really extreme distress when there's changes or uh, when they have to shift or their mindset and difficulty coping with change or have more restricted behaviors there. And so just um, something to look for in a diagnosis, um, the levels, this is what they mean, really just how much support that individual requires. A quick blurb on autism being brain-based. Um, as with 
ADHD, many disorders, there's differences in the structure and function and connectivity of the brain. So a lot of the differences in the brain regions um, lead to the deficits that we see in social language processing, in social attention, um, uh, in executive functions. So we have deficits in cognitive flexibility, which is a big one that we'll talk about. Um, the differences in the brain regions um, are, can be responsible for creating some of the symptoms that we see. The other area is sensory information. Um, and the research suggests that greater activity in the brain um, might actually be a reason as to some of the sensory difficulties that are experienced. So while neurotypical children start to prune their neural connections that are not used or they're not needed, after about age six, uh, people with autism really continue to develop the connections and they're not organized well in the brain. So their brains really just get busier and busier and they have more connections um, which can really result in being overwhelmed easier um, they take in so much more information because of their increased connections that it can be very overwhelming or on the positive side more connections they have uh, can have greater attention to detail so seeing a lot of the individual details sometimes missing out on the big picture but more connections being able to take in more information at a time the connectivity part, um, there's some research suggesting uh, hyperconnectivity. So some regions of the brain are connected more um, than someone without autism, which might lead to some things like a, a connection between uh, vision and selective attention. So hyper-focusing on maybe visual tasks. Uh, and some research says that the, some regions of the brain are actually less connected. So possibly um, a less of a connection between social processing and emotional recognition. So if someone smiles at you, you might actually have less of a reward, less of a social reward there because there's um, those brain regions are less connected than someone without ASD. So just a couple differences in the brain regions um, for autism, just some general research there. Um, I just want you to consider the following sentences. So um, Think about how each one makes you feel. So if we consider the following, uh, Julie is a six-year-old child with ASD and Julie is an autistic six-year-old child. And really when we're thinking about these, um, just kind of think about what you read first and it forms a picture in your mind of the child. So the first sentence, um, for me at least, Julie is um, a child, she's a six-year-old child. The second sentence is Julie is autistic. So with all the diagnosis, the professional language that's used and preferred uh, when speaking about children with autism uh, is this person first language. Person first, disorder second. Um, it's what the person has, not what the person is. And this is heavily preferred by professionals in the field. However, um, person first language on this slide um, is part of kind of the correct view of how we talk about autism. But we also want to consider person-centered language. So person-centered language takes into account uh, what the person would, uh, with autism would like to be referred to. So when we're thinking about person-centered language, it considers the person first even before the language. Even though professionals use person-first language quite a bit, it actually might not be preferred for the person with autism. So if you're not sure what language to use, ask the person. This is a kind of a cool conversation here on the side that looks at um, you can push person first language but if it's not what the person with autism prefers then um, really if they prefer to be called somebody on the autism spectrum or autistic that's just what you would go with um, and there's a lot of research and um, conversations with people with autism that prefer to be called autistic so um, just kind of when in doubt ask now the bulk of the presentation is kind of what to do for students who are struggling and when we're thinking about struggles that we have in the classroom most of this i would like you to think about the challenges in terms of the criteria that we talked about for autism so these big areas that are often very difficult communication social skills rigid thinking behavior um, and sensory needs and these are our guiding questions to identify uh, weaknesses or areas of need while we're just keeping in mind the symptoms for autism. 
generally communication um, is, is difficult. So do they need help communicating something? Are they having difficulties using language to express what they want or what they need? Are they having difficulty understanding the non-literal use um, of language? Are they having difficulties with social skills, making and keeping friends, starting interactions, um, having back and forth conversations, knowing appropriate behavior for the situation, um, even that social chit chat that gets really important when we get into adolescent years. Are we having difficulty making and keeping friends because we can't engage in that back and forth um, chit chat? RRBs, are they having difficulties engaging um, because they're engaging in a ritual or they are being inflexible or they're not able to cope with a transition or a change? Um, often we get children uh, on the spectrum who only like a few activities or they only have a few interests rather than a broad spectrum and they can have stuck thinking so they like following rules or enforcing rules um, difficulty seeing the big picture and really thinking in that black and white terms and having that uh, sensitivity to change so not liking changes in their environment or in the people around them or they have difficulty transitioning so just keeping in mind some of these criteria and we're thinking about autism and sensory being the last one um, are they having difficulty because they're really sensitive to the sensory information around them or they're craving that sensory information and they don't have enough so they're seeking out um, that sensory input uh, and this is just what we're trying to get to when we're thinking of the root of why a person with autism is struggling in the classroom um, these are things we can ask ourselves to try and identify the triggers so that we can inform our intervention um, before I go on to kind of the intervention side of this presentation. There's just a quick video that I wanted um, to show you. It's only about a minute long. Um, and just as a disclaimer, there's a couple flashing lights in the video um, and a couple sounds like an alarm. So just a heads up that that will be in the video. And it's only about a minute long. Too much information. Okay. I had to show that video. It's from the um, National Autistic Society. It's based in the UK, and they do a couple videos um, from the perspective of people with autism just so that um, there's raising awareness about what it's like and this can be some of the sensory information so that child would have been hyper reactive to sensory information meaning that they pick up on everything and they're not able to filter out some of the incoming incoming sensory information which can be quite impairing um, just for that the uh, there's a couple other videos that they get that they have from the National Autistic Society so um, when I talk about interventions, I'm going to go through the interventions like I did for the criteria for autism. And we can just better create interventions when we know the source of the challenge or the root of um, the skill deficit that's occurring. So like we talked about before, communication is kind of the first one when we're talking about social communication uh, difficulties. Um, if we have difficulties communicating, some of the goals 
uh, can be alternative ways to communicate. Um, in our specialized school, this would be quite common to be able to um, have and teach. And that's possibly if they have no language or limited language, um, we just want to help them in, in any way to communicate that we can. Another goal would be to increase vocabulary or the complexity of our communication. So words to sentences to full speech. Uh, the thing with communication is that not all children will achieve full and complex speech. So we just work with them where they're at. Um, increasing the level of communication can be a goal, um, but not necessarily a goal for all people with autism. Some children get to the word level or are nonverbal their entire lives. And so we just develop other ways for them to communicate. And when we're thinking of building language, um, one thing that's important is to use full language ourselves and when we're modeling language. With young children who are even neurotypical, we don't use five words with them when they can only speak five words, we use full language with them. So it's similar to a child with ASD who struggles with communication, correct language modeling um, is ideal. If we are using simplified words, that's okay too, maybe not using very large words, um, but we're using correct grammar and full sentences so that we're able to model that um, more complex level of communication. And as all of you know, communication is not just spoken language. We're helping children with autism communicate in any way that we can. This is not my area of expertise, the alternative communication system, so I'll just briefly go over it. Um, hopefully when we're looking at these things, we're uh, having a team approach to be communication. So maybe occupational therapy and a speech pathologist to help with um, receptive, expressive language, vocabulary, things like that. Um, but generally we use a couple of these things or one of them, um, the picture exchange communication system is common exchanging a picture for um, something that you want, kind of that's in its simplistic terms of what it is. Um, technology can also take the place of that, having the iPads over there to make uh, sentences or to request something, to request, request somewhere to go. And then any visuals, so schedules, prompts, cues, like you see there. Visuals are for everyone on the spectrum. Anything that can be made into a visual should. Research suggests that people with autism have a much better um, understanding of visual information over verbal information. So there's a reason why visuals work with people with autism. Um, not for all people with autism, but um, generally visual information is much better understood. We're talking about social skills. These are the four that we're really looking at and they increase in complexity as we go down. Uh, social skills training is really all of this and it's based on the assumption that the problems with social interactions are a result of poorly developed knowledge of the social rules of the world. So first, we, what we want to do before anything is to improve social awareness and attention, um, help the children attend to social cues. If they can't pay attention to the social cues or they're not aware of their surroundings or the people in them, um, we actually can't go on to any of the other steps. So first we have to make sure that they're aware and that they're paying attention to verbal information, nonverbal information, the environment around them. And then we can improve how we interpret those situations. Once we're attending to it, um, can we understand the situ social situation and read what, uh, what's happening in them? Then we can go on to teaching the actual skills to be successful in social situations, um, participating in the situations and actually uh, identifying skills and learning what we need in order to be successful. After all of that, that's when we can work on social problem solving. Uh, this is the last stage, the most complex stage, because we're dealing with problem solving, um, problem solving conflict, anything that might come up in a social situation that might be difficult. And if we're working on social problem solving, but we're not able to actually interpret social cues accurately, um, we won't be successful, which is why that kind of goes in progression here. I'm always kind of working on the most simple and then working um, to more complex skills. Again, some children won't achieve the social problem solving skills, but making sure that we're not jumping steps, uh, which can be a source of frustration for many children. I'm just going to go over some basic strategies that research has said are most useful for teaching social skills to people with autism. I'm sure many of you are aware of some or all of these. 
And the goal is just really to know how to quickly make them yourself um, because they're so helpful for children with autism and really they can be used in any population to teach social skills. So we'll go through social stories, power cards, scripts, um, the comic strip conversations, and some other quick reference cards, social problem solving, and then how we practice these skills. Everyone is familiar with social stories. There's um, such a wide range of uses for them. You can teach behavior, prepare for changes, teach skills or routines. Um, it's really good with theory of mind, which we'll talk about in a second, um, understanding the perspective of others. This story um, is just part of a social story that I made for I Can Ask to Play. Um, you can just kind of see some of the really simple wording used in a social story. They're really a concrete way to improve someone's understanding of a situation, um, a difficult concept or an ambiguous situation. And the basic layout um, is to provide children with appropriate interactions. They include topics or characters that the child's interested in. They can be presented in different ways, so cartoons or sentences or real pictures of the child that you've taken or a mixture of all of them. There's actually quite a lot of structure and rules that go into a social story. Um, but generally, um, the social story, Carol Gray, who created them in 1991, kind of gave some general boundaries. I won't go through anything specific uh, with you, but mostly when we're looking at a social story, most of the information we want to provide is describing. So who is in the situation? What's happening? Where is it? Um, describing the thoughts and the feelings of the people, how they might other people might react in certain situations, um, how others might perceive an event. And most sentences should describe and look at how um, the child and others perceive a situation and a lot of description. And that really just helps the person with autism understand what's happening and what's happening in the minds of other people. Then there's uh, other sentences that should be less that describe the desired response. So in here, we, I can ask to play um, instead of just jumping in and playing uh, without asking. And these just really just teach what the child what they're supposed to be doing. And then there's, again, a few sentences that are considered control sentences. And they're just a way to remember the social story. So maybe if you don't have um, pictures like this, you have... Um, pictures of Thomas the Train that you can use to really hook the child into remembering the social story. And social stories are something that can be reviewed daily. They can fade when you've achieved the skill and they might be revisited or altered later, kind of depending on what the child needs. Um, and again, there's a lot of rules around social stories, but generally if you do a really good job describing the situation and the feelings of other people, um, and then a little bit of information about what you would expect from the child or what is appropriate behavior, that's, that's a good social story. And just making them quite simple. Um, this social story I believe that I made is about 14 slides. So they don't have to be that long. I'm considering there's only one sentence for each, um, but making sure you're providing enough information about the thoughts and actions of other people that it helps inform the child about the situation. Power cards are something else. Um, here I've Tommy the train, close enough. Um, these are really just used for teaching pro appropriate behavior as well, but they're much shorter. They teach the child what to do and they're usually just a quick reference. They use a character for motivation. Um, so here you can have any character you want just for the sake of our presentation. This is Tommy the train um, and you use them in problematic situations. They have a couple steps, so about three to five, and they give a problem solving strategy that allows the child to take power over their situation and it often uses a special interest. So for this one, it's about keeping our hands and feet or our wheels to ourself um, and just a couple steps on how to do that, when to do that, what's expected of us and as a quick reminder that Tommy the train keeps his wheels to himself. He stays on his own track. We can do that as well. And it's just a little bit more motivating and quite short as a quick reminder on appropriate behavior. Again, um, typically using the child's special interests to motivate them. Scripts are another area. Um, scripts can be written. They can have visuals. They can have pictures. They can be a script on exactly what to say in a situation. They can be a script on what to expect from a situation and they prepare us for something that's uncertain. So the main goal is to reduce stress in a social situation by just letting us know 
what to expect, what might happen, or what might go wrong, and how to deal with it. Um, you can look at uh, teaching routines through this. Um, you can look at other areas like um, how to disagree with others and have a script for that, how to start a conversation, how to give your opinion, how to respond to peer pressure, and just really about dealing with uncertain circumstances. So for this one, um, obviously this person might be working on independence uh, or going out into the community and they're starting with a small task like buying a chocolate bar and it just reduces the anxiety about this possibly anxiety provoking situation. It includes social norms like how we're supposed to wait, take turns and it's just um, there to reduce the stress involved in this simple task. Again you can also have scripts for um, how to ask somebody out on a date. You could have actual verbal scripts on what you could say um, and what the other person might say just to prepare for scenarios um, that might be uncertain. Comic strip conversations are another way to teach social skills and they're just a visual representation of certain conversations. They include what's said, what people might feel, what people might be thinking, or other people's intentions. Um, Really, when you're looking at comic strip conversations, they involve small talk, maybe some starting um, information, some questions that people might ask. They might summarize an event, address a problem, and then develop an action plan on what is expected to happen. Um, here we can see um, he's thinking about joining his friends, um, but he says something unexpected um, that might be not appropriate for the situation. And while in normal situations, in real life, you can't read what other people are thinking, it's hard to tell, this just provides some insight into what people might be thinking in that circumstance um, that you can refer back to that, oh, I'm not actually, don't want to talk to this person, or I don't know what to say, that was an odd saying, or he interrupted us and I didn't like that. So things that we might not realize that people are thinking, and you can just really clearly illustrate it here in a format that's more friendly to look at um, and explains uh, social situ situations uh, deeply. And you can make them more complex by adding different colors or different pictures. I think often they use different colors in the text to convey emotions. Like if it's red text, that means they're angry or green is a good idea or somebody that's happy, blue is sad, things like that. So you can just make them more complex as you need to, to try and convey the most information possible. Um, and typically they're much longer than these two panels, you can have um, a, couple, a couple panels looking at a situation. Um, it just is another way to have a visual representation, again, tapping into that visual side of a conversation, something that's typically quite challenging for somebody with autism. Quick reference cards. These are really like the adult version of a power card. Um, Usually they are looking at skills that the child has already learned. So we're not necessarily teaching skills through quick reference cards. It's just reminding them what's appropriate for different environments or for different people or for different activities. And they can be really whatever you want. The top ones here we see that are really simple, just some words to remind you what to do in the library or remind you when someone is sad what um, three things you should do. Maybe it's because we've already learned all these skills and we forgot that we actually have to listen to the person who is sad. So we can just remind um, children that way, or they can be more complex like all the ones with visuals here. Accepting a compliment, if we're working on that, we've already taught these skills and we can just be reminded with the visuals that we have to look at the person, listen to them, smile and say thank you. And that's how we appropriately accept a compliment. And these can just be really for anything that you wanna teach, um, or that you have taught to remind them of the skills they've learned or just appropriate behavior for the environment. Social problem solving cards are the most complex. Um, there's typically a scenario on a card and you're just helping them problem solve through the situation. For these cards, much like we talked about how social skills increase in complexity, the child needs to be socially aware and attentive already they need to know how to interpret social situations and they need to know the social skills themselves before they can social problem solve. So this is actually quite complex. If you ask them, um, you ask somebody to move when you're sitting beside them on the carpet and they said, no, what would you do? And you can help them through an appropriate reaction for that, um, what to 
um, how to interpret the situation, what the other person might be thinking or feeling, and just problem solving through that. Um, really any situation or some situation that is particularly challenging for that student. And again, only using these type of cards when the student actually has a quite strong understanding of social situations already. Um, my last one here for social skills. This is really a typical trajectory for practicing social skills, um, starting with kind of our needs analysis, going into direct instruction, and then modeling and then practice. Um, the needs analysis really informs the goals on the rest of the um, chart that we see here. So something specific that you want to target. It could be a skill deficit, something that's often seen to be difficult for the child, or something that we know is going to be helpful for the future. Like if we know the child is going to apply for an internship or a job, uh, we might need to teach them interview skills, and we know that that is a need. Then we go into direct instruction, which is really just explicit teaching, um, concrete of the skills. Um, you can do this through teachable moments, ex um, explanations on what to do and why we're doing it, and giving lots of examples um, and demonstrations. And then we go into a whole uh, bunch of modeling. So you can model yourself, um, you can have peer modeling, they could watch their friends complete the skill, they could mirror their friends completing the skill. Um, video modeling, you can video the child uh, completing the skill and talk about what they did successfully, what they need to work on, or you could have a video of someone who is successfully completing that skill and you and the child can watch it. And then you go into role playing. So uh, role playing with an adult or friends who are willing to practice with you and then role playing um, in different situations and then going out into real life and practicing. And with all of these, we're using reinforcement throughout um, and corrective feedback. So we can use corrective feedback when we are modeling and role playing. So kind of within the situation, kind of feeding prompts and giving feedback there. Or if we're working on more independent skills in social situations, we can just debrief after to say, this was really great when you did this, or this person looked confused when you said this. Um, I'm really providing more information, but typically this is the trajectory that we're looking at for teaching social skills and practicing social skills. Uh, and just kind of quickly, something as an example that would um, maybe inform what you do on the previous slide. Um, this is an example of skills to target. So this is more for friendship making and keeping skills. Uh, maybe they don't know how to join a conversation, but they know, um, where they know how to join a conversation but they don't know how to leave the conversation, that can be a goal. Or offering to help other people can be a specific goal. Um, conversational skills can be something else. So knowing how to keep a conversation going or complimenting other people or compromise or respond to teasing or bullying. There can be a whole bunch of specific skills that you can work on um, and making sure that, again, with the needs analysis, you're identifying something relatively specific. Emotional regulation would be a big skill that you would need to um, really go down into something more specific. Do they have trouble reading others' emotions or um, reading their own emotions or coping with their emotions or standing up for themselves? Uh, that can be emotional regulation. That's something that is more specific that we're working on. And then generally just with social skills, we want to make sure that the generalization of skills goes between contexts or people or activities. Um, just some guidelines on how to teach the skills that will go beyond the context in which you're teaching it. Obviously, we want to keep um, teaching the skills in a variety of environments with a variety of people. That always helps with generalization to practice in a whole bunch of different environments. Um, but we also want to model the skills all the time. We want to say if we're working on listening skills, we can point out when we're using the skills or when they should be using the skills. We can cue the students. So um, now would be a good time to use your listening skills to know when to use them. We can structure activities um, and set the roles that we want people to play within the scenario. So during this activity, you're going to be the listener and you're going to be the one talking. We can model the responses in social situations. Um, and if they're struggling, we can always feed language to the student when they're stuck. Uh, creating learning opportunities where the student can share their proficiencies. So if they're really good with memory, 
um, or they're working on something that they really enjoy, that might make practicing the skill much easier and more motivating um, to promote that generalization of skills. We want to focus on the process rather than the end product. So what they're learning along the way, not necessarily if they were successful in every part or the whole interaction, just um, little bits, small goals along the way. You might need a reward system for actually using the social skills. Maybe they know all the steps um, and they know when to use them, but they're not using the skills. So you might need a reward system on uh, when they use the skills, you can provide a reinforcement. And then a really important one is to educate the people around um, the child on how to respond. Um, particularly when you're practicing skills, it makes it much more successful uh, in the learning stage when others know how to respond and don't make it tricky and jump into problem solving when we're still just learning when to use the skill. And so really educating others on what they should be doing and how they can help the student is, is quite helpful. I want to touch on theory of mind. This is um, really a social skill and there's quite a bit of debate about the topic, but generally it's thought that children with autism are delayed in their theory of mind. Uh, and theory of mind is really important in developing social skills. So that's kind of theory of mind there, knowing and understanding others have different emotions, thoughts, intentions. And theory of mind is related to social functioning because it includes our ability to engage in conversations, to resolve conflicts, to maintain friendships. Um, it helps us form our own responses to others. So when we're thinking about what to say, we're considering what another person might be feeling or thinking or wanting. And this consideration means that we understand what the other people are thinking and respond appropriately. This is the typical development of theory of mind. And uh, we go from quite a basic understanding at two years old, um, just knowing that um, others can like things, they can want things. Um, basic in that we would know that if someone else is happy, if they get what they want, or they'd be sad if they don't get what they want. Around age three, we start going into what people think. So instead of what they want, we know that they have thoughts, but we generally think that everyone knows what we know, which is really poor theory of mind. It's around age four and five that we get this big jump and we understand that people's thoughts are different than ours. Um, we start to understand that people have thoughts that might not necessarily even be true and that people might want and like different things. So this is kind of where that theory of mind develops um, and we have a big jump around age four and five. And then as we get older, there's just more complexity. Um, so sarcasm starts to emerge around age six and seven, um, social deception starts to emerge at age eight and nine so that people can deliberately conceal their emotions by maybe disguising their facial expressions. Um, and then really just increases in complexity with age about how much we understand about others' thoughts, feelings, and intentions. And how researchers looked at theory of mind um, was through these very old research tasks on false beliefs. Um, and so there's the crayon candle task and the Sally and Anne task that really when you're looking at these uh, false beliefs you're looking at beliefs that can differ from reality so for the crayon candle um, research task that child there on the top it's shown a crayon box and they were asked what was in the crayon box and obviously the child would say crayons and then the children were shown that the crayon box actually contained candles inside not crayons um, so they have the candles on the desk and they put them back in the box and then the children were asked to state their initial belief. So what did you think was in the box? Children under four who have um, less theory of mind would say that they always thought that the candles were in the box because they're not able to understand that they had changed their belief um, or that their initial belief could actually be false. So this is very similar with the Sally and Anne task. Children were told that um, Sally um, over here has a marble and she's going to put it in the basket. And Anne over here, she has her own metal tin. Um, once Sally puts the marble in the basket, she's going to leave. Um, Anne is going to go over and take the marble and put it in her tin. So then children are then asked, when Anne comes back, where will she look for the marble? And children under four will say, well, she needs to look in the tin because they know the marble's in the tin. 
they have a very hard time knowing that not everyone knows what they know. So this is our leap in theory of mind. Uh, about age four, children start to realize that Sally is actually going to go look in the basket because she's unaware of what Anne did. She's unaware of what Anne is thinking. And that's why we teach theory of mind to children. Uh, it develops social awareness, which is a huge precursor to successful social interactions. People can have different things, uh, different thoughts. They can act on their thoughts. They can um, have different feelings. Just kind of a very popular activity um, is this peanut butter and jelly survey. So we want to teach that others have different ideas, different thoughts, different viewpoints. Um, different perspectives. And this is just an activity to get children to think about others' thoughts and how they might differ from their own and more of a fun way to explore um, different preferences. Um, this is differences on how to make a perfect peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And it would be very unlikely that everybody in the class, if you did this with an entire class, would pick the exact same sandwich. So you'd have the differences in um, what peanut butter they want or how much or how to even slice the bread and just a really simple activity to start thinking about um, different perspectives and that other people might want different things. And then just some other um, activities for theory of mind. Um, discussing scenarios is really important so if you're looking at pictures discussing different social situations to help children interpret uh, what someone is thinking, feeling, um, just by looking or you can act out scenarios like in role play that are typically difficult and teaching as you go. So all of those words around the page are just important parts of what to attend to. Um, we're teaching children that we're looking at facial expressions, um, how their hands are placed, uh, body positioning, the words and the sounds that they're making, environmental cues, even where are you, might be different to interpret a social situation at school versus when you're at home. Um, and then even background knowledge about the person. If we're interpreting um, what they are thinking, what do we already know about what they like or dislike? Um, how maybe they've reacted in a similar situation that we can call upon to try and decode um, what they're thinking or what they're feeling. And just really paying attention to all of these different areas when we're trying to teach theory of mind. RRBs are kind of our last um, area here and just the goal is to increase um, executive functions the big ones are usually cognitive flexibility and shifting and then special interests um, we'll work on using special interests and expanding interests as well stuck thinking is something that um, I deal with frequently that people ask about ask to how to program for and that would fall into the area of RRBs when we're thinking about autism so this is when stuck thinking occurs. Um, if we don't know the choices, if children don't know the plan, um, they don't know that there's alternative or other ways to complete a task. Um, so it can be hard to think of them if they don't actually know that there is other choices available or that other people would have different um, ideas or choices. Um, maybe children know the plan, but they're not aware of their own role or how to start it. So if we don't know how to start or what we're supposed to do, that can mean, make us stuck. Um, maybe the child knows the plan, but they want to do it their own way, which is um, very frequent. Um, so they think their way is the best, and that can make us stuck as well. Or they're just simply unable to let go of their own idea. Even when they're given alternatives, different ideas, um, they just have difficulty transitioning and shifting their thoughts. And so on the other side, this would be what we're teaching, flexible thinking. Um, and that really occurs when they understand the choices available and they're guided through how to look at things differently. Um, we're teaching them how to compromise, how to deal with changes, how to try things different ways, uh, and then how to let go, how to cope with sh uh, change, how to shift, uh, and how to cope with our emotions when we do need to transition. And how we're teaching that, how we get over that stuck thinking, we're increasing flexibility, really. Um, we're teaching transitioning skills and shifting. Because kids who struggle with cognitive flexibility, shifting with transitions, they often have difficulty changing from one task to another, uh, transitioning between environments. They usually resist changes in um, changes to their routine or changes in the food they're eating, and they can get stuck and think too much on the same topic. They often require so much more explanation and demonstration to grasp the demands of a task. And 
they really need problem solving supports. They usually carry over problem solving approaches that they've used from previous tasks. Um, and they're really no longer appropriate for their task or they don't work. So they need to support to be flexible on how to develop new problem solving tasks. And how we do that is through a bunch of supports here. Um, the first one is introducing change gradually. So slowly adjusting routines, transitioning slowly. Um, I know a big one that is difficult is transitioning from a, not, a preferred activity to a non-preferred activity. And, and so gradual change would be maybe using a neutral activity to help support that. So that we're going from preferred to neutral to non-preferred is a much easier transition than just preferred to non-preferred. Consistency in teaching is big, um, just really consistency across the, across the board. Um, teaching strategies that remain the same um, across time, across courses, across environments, across people. Um, consistency is really huge for people with autism. Um, providing external guides to change visuals, again, schedules, calendars, so they can see the change coming up and are prepared for it. Um, develop alternative routines. So, we're keeping daily routines, that's part of that consistency. So for example, your daily routine, you always know you have a morning schedule, a school schedule, and an evening schedule. There are subroutines within that. So for example, our morning schedule is maybe brushing our teeth, washing up, getting dressed, packing a backpack, taking the bus to school. That is a subroutine. Um, and so maybe something we change is getting to school in different ways. So not always the bus, sometimes we're walking, sometimes we are um, getting driven to school. That is just a, a subroutine that we can change while we're keeping our big routines the same. Um, big routines being the same makes uh, our days consistent, but making small changes like that within routines can help us um, shift and have more cognitive flexibility. And then presenting one task at a time. So when we have difficulty shifting, um, one thing at a time is often quite helpful and also providing limited choices. So if we have trouble shifting between a whole bunch of tasks at school, um, maybe we just shift less and we have one thing at a time instead of working on a couple things at a time and then we can work on transitioning that way, um, it's just much easier. And then the last one's here, practicing shifting. So if you actually want to work on shifting itself, um, you can get two or three familiar tasks and just rotate them at regular intervals. So that helps build flexibility, get the child accustomed to shifting, um, and really just maybe they're even fun tasks or games and we're just switching them every 10 minutes so we're practicing shifting on its own. Preparing for changes, giving advance notice with maybe a five minute warning, a warning, um, one minute warning, allowing for a few minutes of downtime before another activity starts is also helpful. Um, and then just giving time limits and pre uh, preparation before next tasks are going to occur. Social emotional skills are big, obviously, um, working on how to actually deal with the emotions that come with difficult transitions or change, how we're coping when we're anxious, um, how we are going to calm ourselves when we are um, feeling distressed. Um, making change its own routine is something else. So if you are making a consistent uh, change all the time, like you have a certain sound that indicates that it's time to stop our break and start work again, that's a change in its own routine itself. Uh, because each child will know that once I hear that sound, I know that routine. I know that we are stopping and we're going to start work again. And so just having that consistency is um, really a routine in itself and really consistent. Peer modeling. Um, working in small groups when we are transitioning or changing so that we can see how others appropriately transition and shift. And then social skills practice is kind of what we talked about. Learning how to compromise and how, what is socially appropriate when I'm shifting or transitioning is quite helpful as well. And that is kind of put together some more fun activities to boost cognitive flexibility, help with transition or shifting uh, that you can work on that the child may not necessarily know that's what they're working on but just some fun things to um, help boost that cognitive flexibility so one of them is to use objects in as many ways possible so if you take an object like a funnel and you can see how many different things you can do with it or how many different things a friend can do with it and you practice seeing others perspective and what they would choose to do with the object versus what you would choose to the op do with the object you can make up new rules for games this one's pretty common 
like if I, you have a board game for snakes and ladders, you might go down the ladders and up the snakes. Or a social game like Duck, Duck, Goose, you could play Goose, Goose, Duck, just something that is different um, to be able to increase flexibility. Providing alternatives all the time, just letting children know that there are alternatives for pretty much every situation. So at snack, would you like raspberry or strawberry jam? Or do you want a break in two minutes or four minutes? And then books like um, you see here, Amelia Bedelia, she's wonderful. She takes everything very literally. So you can have discussions about what the sayings mean, how Amelia could fix her mistakes. Um, here she was told they're going to hit the road and she's out there actually hitting the road. And you can talk about um, how she has stuck thinking and taking that uh, quite literally. And also talking about jokes or puns or figures of speech and just how people use those differently to have more uh, flexibility in how we use language like it's raining cats and dogs it's not actually raining cats and dogs um, it's just a saying and talking about what typical sayings mean for special interests um kind of two sides to this one so we're using special interests but we also want to expand on special interests so when we're using them they can help children engage in academics or social skills or self-help skills research suggests that when children are engaging in or talking about their special interests, they were more confident, they were more expressive. So if we use the special interests, they can really help engage with learning. We could use them to help with emotional regulation. Um, so if a person who loves puzzles can solve them when they're upset, um, we can help get motivated for difficult tasks. So if the person is engaging in their special interests, they might be able to work on a difficult academic skill for longer or tolerate more sensory experiences. And um, just for example, for younger kids, if they are learning how to decode, they can decode their favorite Pokemon names. Those are quite strange. Um, or they could have a power card with their favorite character to learn a social skill. And for older children, they could take the viewpoint of their favorite TV character when they're writing an essay instead of um, their own viewpoint. They could, um, if you have a, someone who really enjoys taking things apart, they could take something apart and complete a paper on how they did that. Um, if your student loves categorizing objects, they can categorize certain math problems by color and then complete them in category. Just any way that we can tap into those special interests um, is really important because those are intrinsically motivating for children with ASD. And if we want learning to be intrinsically motivating as well, those interests can help. On the other side, uh, we also want to expand on their special interests. Boundaries are quite important. So like time limits or a certain amount um, that the person can engage in the special interest just so it doesn't take up all of their days. Um, we want to be able to have some other interests and other activities we engage in as well. But together, you kind of just create goals about how much time they can spend on their special interests. So for example, uh, maybe you can only talk about trains for um, 15 minutes every hour. And then when you're done that, that's, that's it for the hour. However, because these special interests are so important to these kids, we also need to provide them with alternatives. We can't just say your 15 minutes is up for this hour and that's it. There's no more talking about trains. We need to provide them with alternatives. They could draw a train, they could write in their journal about a train, they could play a game with a train, just other things that they can do because it's so motivating for them. Uh, when the interest we're putting boundaries around is maybe sensory related, like they really enjoy spinning in circles, we can provide them with alternatives like um, going on a swing. Because we always want to remember that they are engaging in these interests because they enjoy them so much but also they lower their anxiety. So we would be taking away what they're using to lower their own anxiety. So we can't just tell them to stop. We need to also give them a replacement behavior. So boundaries and then providing them with alternatives on what to do. The last area that we'll talk about is sensory. Um, and really with this slide, I just want to have everyone consider um, all of the senses. So not only a few, but everything that a child might experience. Um, all of these can affect someone with autism every day, all the time. Um, tactile, this can be with textures or how they're feeling the world. Um, they might really enjoy textures and rub maybe something soft on their face, or they might really dislike certain textures, like they don't like getting their hands dirty, or they don't like getting their nails cut, 
or getting their hair washed or getting hugs. That is how that might affect them. Same thing with sounds. They might really like sounds and music or they might be very sensitive to certain pitches or um, sounds that certain machines make. Uh, vestibular sense, so balance even. Uh, maybe they have difficulty keeping their body upright or planning motor tasks. They might be afraid of going downstairs because um, they have poor balance. That's one of our senses. Same thing with sight. They might be really absorbed by visual tasks or they might be really overwhelmed. Maybe fluorescent lights or the sun overwhelms them, um, which can be quite impairing. Taste, they might crave oral inputs. They might chew on their clothes, put items in their mouth, or they might have difficulties at snack time because they don't like some of the textures that are in their food. Smell, always kind of being mindful of smells that are around. Um, if they dislike certain smells, I know I worked with a child who would refuse to use a certain type of hand soap because of the smell. And so it's keeping in mind that that can be um, one of the senses that are experienced all the time as well. And then proprioception, so a body awareness. Um, bodies, someone's body in space where they are, the direction of their movement, the amount of force that's used when they're moving. So these children might push other people, they might run into people because they're just not sure where their body is in space and it might look like they're aggressive but really they're just seeking that sensory input to decide where they are and our job is really just altering the environment to meet the child's needs um, one environment here we can see is quite visually busy the other one is quite plain so one's not good and the other isn't bad but it's just being intentional with what we have in the classroom and again considering all of the senses so tactile sense are we greeting the kids with high fives and maybe that's overwhelming instead they might want a wave or hello um, does the child not like washing their hands because of how it feels and that really makes them late for snack time all the time um, is the classroom noisy um, is it visually busy that it gets really distracting for the person um, for a vestibular sense they have difficulties sitting upright, so they might require a seat with a back if they're sitting for carpet time, or a wedge seat in their uh, chair at the desk, or maybe a stool um, for their feet to keep them grounded when they're doing seated work. Uh, same thing with um, kind of proprioception, seats that require, or seats that are built for movement can help, so children can consistently test where they are in space, or even having like a crash pillow for kids who really crave that input. Um, that can just be helpful to create this sensory environment that helps children pay attention so they can pay attention to learning without uh, consistently worrying about um, their sensory environment. Um, meeting sensory needs. Again, this is not my area of expertise. I don't have a background in occupational therapy. So we always want to make sure that this is informed by an occupational therapist. And this is just really being proactive and building sensory uh, breaks throughout the day as part of the schedule. Uh, we want to meet the sensory needs so that ultimately we're decreasing behavior that we're seeing. Uh, we want to track the child's behavior to see when, which places and which activities the child is typically overwhelmed or craves that sensory stimulation. And each child is different. Typically the, ch the, the times that can be difficult for children, um, the common ones are transitions, snack time, unstructured time, seated work, something that's really difficult, maybe um, they really struggle with math or writing, and then peer interactions. So that's when they would most struggle and maybe need sensory support before, during, or after, or maybe all of them. And just making sure that we're working that into the day, even if the child doesn't seem like they typically struggle with sensory um, input, um, we're still doing this because sensory is um, quite a large aspect of autism. It's kind of one of the visuals I made just for ideas. I won't go through all of it, um, just for common sensory tools or activities. And this just is, teaches coping skills for these kids. Um, considering again, all of our senses that might possibly interfere with our learning, uh, auditory, visual, gustatory, anything that we might want to learn how to do if we are hyper or hypo reactive to sensory stimuli. So whether you're very sensitive to it or you crave that input, kind of the opposite side of each on some examples of what the child can learn to do to help cope in each environment that they're in and that there's a lot of activities that they can do on their own to be able to regulate themselves. Um, the last two slides here 
uh, I talk about academic supports because um, I get the question all the time about recommendations for the child in the classroom who has autism. Now, there's no specific academic supports for autism. They're so unique to each person that um, everything that we just talked about, that's what helps with academics. There's no one intervention academically for a child with autism. It can help to understand if the person with autism has maybe difficulties with language or an intellectual disability or a learning disorder, but the strategies in the presentation are the ones that will work in the classroom and make academic work easier. Typically, academic accommodations that are successful with neurotypical children work for children with ASD, as long as they have all of those other supports in place for what they struggle with, like the root of their problems. So is it flexibility? Is it sensory? Is it social skills? For example, for writing, to get that writing is very difficult for this child with autism and they refuse to start to write or um, they start to write, but they can never write more than a sentence. Uh, and that could be a bunch of things. So if we look back on what we uh, learned for the criteria for autism, it could be sensory. They don't like how the pencil feels or the sound of the pencil. It could be their balance or their coordination in the chair. They're not able to sit for a long enough period of time to pay attention. Their executive functions are, functions are often weaker. They can't organize or plan their work. Or they're expected to take the perspective of someone in a position paper, which is theory of mind, and that's very difficult for them. So just kind of thinking about the academic supports in um, context of the symptoms of autism, that is probably what is the most successful in the classroom. Um, our job is really to identify how the symptoms of autism can affect the student. Um, and just a little research that's coming up for writing specifically, um, that writing is actually more complex and difficult for children with autism than in the general population because of all those things that we talked about. There's so much that goes into writing. That's one of the most frequent referrals that I get um, is that this, struggle, this child struggles with writing um, and they have autism. What do I do? So we're looking at the root of the problems again, everything that I just talked about and considering all of those. Just keeping in mind some other areas that are impacted by autism, um, mental health. Often people with autism, more often than not, have a co-occurring disorder. Um, autism is rarely diagnosed alone, um, especially when we get into adolescence and adulthood. So these children often have other difficulties like anxiety or depression or ADHD that affect them in the classroom. And those are important to consider as well. Same thing with self-esteem. Uh, children are can be aware of their differences and so therefore they have lower self-esteem or they receive constant correction and negative feedback from their peers and so that creates lower feelings of self-worth. Um, we want to consider that as well as how our supports that we're providing might actually impact their self-esteem as well. So even for the children who may not vocalize that they feel different or that they don't like looking different, we still want to be aware of how our interventions might be perceived, especially to their peers, just to be mindful of their self-esteem. And then adaptive skills are often something that we work on with children with autism, um, how to join group activities, how to stay safe, how to use the bathroom, how to ask for a break, just a, a bunch of other factors that can be also supported at the school level and at home. And really with all of these together, they just help with overall functioning for the child with autism. And they can be really just, just as important to program for as anything else. Um, yeah, just very important there. Uh, and last, like all the presentations, kind of give some of my favorite resources for um, the Autism Speaks one. They have toolkits for behavior, challenging situations, uh, going to the dentist, sleep, getting haircuts. They have toolkits for employment. They have some really good um, toolkits in general. The Autism Help website, um, they have a tab that says find information for, and you can look by age range and topics, so three to five year old social skills or sensory interests, which is quite helpful. And the researchautism.org, they have this kit called Kit for Kids, and it helps other people understand autism. So there's a whole series divided by grades with activities and workbooks for um, classrooms on other people understanding and supporting autism as well. Um, the other ones at the bottom, there's some visuals on how to create visuals or how to um, create visual schedules for free. There's some uh, websites there. And then there is um, a video that can be appropriate for kids or adults, The Amazing Things Happen. 
it explains autism very well. It's a cartoon. If you wanted to check that one out, it's not very long. It's only five minutes, um, but it's wonderful either for children to explain autism or for adults. And then there's an online course that it says is four weeks long, but you can likely completed in a day, Understanding Autism for the University of Kent. And it's actually quite helpful. Um, they have some really good research and videos on autism there. Um, so just a couple uh, resources there that I thought I would point out. That's all I have for you. Um, if anyone wants to stick around for questions, I am available. Thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs>